the world, the world's writers will walk through those gates. And uh, if you hang around, you get a chance to talk to them. I'm interested in conversations that deal with things that matter, that real, you know, how do we live our lives? First of all, make climate change personal in your life. The second step is get angry and get active. And the third step, and believe it or not, I think this is the most important. We have to imagine this world that we want to hurry towards. But kindness is looking at people as people and not as, I voted this, I do this, whatever it is. There are some people we will never get along with, but most of us, most of us are a complex mass of different things. My name is Raja Shahadi. I've been participating in the Edinburgh International Book Festival for many years. The festival has been central to my development as a writer. The thrill I feel as I enter Charlotte Square has never waned. I could always count on excellent programming and stimulating discussions. There has never been a time when such meetings are more important. We were never meant to grace the fronts of magazine covers. At best, we'd maybe be somewhere toward the end, as the before part of a before versus after it. Never were we meant to be the standard of beauty. Because, you see, beauty has glass and finesse. It's that $10,000 painting hanging in the city's gallery. St. Peter's Basilica, Portrait of the Last Supper. It's Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, and Michelangelo, but we were more Picasso. Nice to look at, but with everything in all the wrong places, wrong proportions, our noses, our hair, spectacle, yeah, but beautiful? Nah. Well, maybe our real beauty was on the inside. So we looked inside. And when we had trouble finding magazine cover type beauty, we undressed in front of open windows, hoping that random passers-by could catch a glimpse, maybe see our hidden birthmarks and beauty spots, but all they sought were our G-spots. They were fascinated by our thickness, so they opened up their studios, flashed their lenses, and boom. We were on magazine covers, <laughs> but they forgot to cover us. And they just couldn't help but Photoshop us because white hips are nice, but these days thigh gaps are trending. A Lupita type skin is awesome if you win an Oscar, but everyone else, please stand in line at the bleaching fountain. Tracy Chapman may have been a legend, but we all know that black hair was never meant to be worn in public. So like Annalise, we only wear it when we're really, really stressed. And even then, it only goes as far as down the stairs. So we threw ourselves downstairs, hoping that if enough of our bones got broken, they would heal in more contorted orientations and we would capture their fascination.
But no matter how many times we fell, we never got up looking like Barbie dolls. They loved how we looked broken, draped on those wooden floors. So they said, higher, more ridiculous standards of beauty. The dark skinned were dipped in stronger bleach. The humble chested got bigger boob jobs. Even our daughters were born into photo ops. And our mothers never told us that we would never look like them. Because they are not real. Real people don't look like they just came off an assembly line. So how about we get out of line? Stop trying. Put on a little less makeup. Do a little more soul searching. Ask ourselves if there is any divinity to be seen in the 1,000 shades that are African skin. In the gravity-defying texture of our hair and the color of our eyes. Let's uncover those birthmarks and beauty spots. This time, less for strangers' eyes and more for the mirror. Let's decide what each one means to us. We are for more than magazine covers, and not because we're mothers, sisters, and daughters, but we have God in us. And his image is as diverse an expression as each of our smiles. So how about you do a girl a favor? Next time you look in the mirror, smile and tell your reflection she is the most beautiful thing that you have ever seen. Hello, welcome to the Outriders Africa to the Edinburgh International Book Festival podcast. I am your host, Kate Simpson, digital historian and lecturer in information studies at the University of Glasgow. Today, I am talking to Nadine Aisha Jasset. Nadine with uh, Tsingi Bangaramba was one of a pair of writers who took part in Outriders Africa for this year's festival. Nadine is a writer and creative practitioner. Her poetry, narrative, nonfiction, and short stories have been published widely, including in It's Not About the Burker by Picador, 404 Inks, Highly Praised Nasty Woman. Her work has drawn widespread acclaim. For example, in 2018, she received a Scottish Book Trust New Writers Award for fiction, and she was also nominated for the prestigious Edwin Morgan Poetry Award. In 2017, she was named one of 30 inspiring young women under 30 in Scotland by the YWCA Scotland. Her debut poetry collection, Let Me Tell You This, again by 404 Inc, was described by Scotland's macker Jackie Kay as a punchy, powerful debut. It's a truly great poetry collection. I particularly like the Built to Last trilogy with your words, Nadine, about the British Museum. You old colossal colonial thing, at one turn a marvel of the world, at another a treasure grabbing fiend. Nadine, along with Tsitsi, took part in this year's somewhat truncated Outriders Africa for the Edinburgh International Book Festival. Outriders saw 10 writers explore a region of Africa. Each pair of writers embarked on an international journey, meeting writers and communities along the way and engaging in discussion and research around migration, colonial legacies, inequalities and impact of globalization and environmental change. Nadine's focus was on legacy and lineage, rooted in understanding her own family lineage. And Nadine asked what bodies we are carrying. She is uh, creating a new work in response to her journey as well. Hello, Nadine. It's lovely to have you. Hey, Kate. Uh, it's lovely to be here. Thank you. Can you tell me a little about what your impetus was for going on this journey? Of course. Um, so for me, Outriders Africa was almost a journey that was a bit bigger than itself, I guess, in many ways, um, because of my family history, family connection um, in Southern Africa. My father is from Zimbabwe and he has ancestry which is kind of spread across and is very typical of um southern africa um for me it was it was in some ways a, a homecoming and a return but as a writer rather than you, the usual homecoming and return as a, a daughter a granddaughter a niece a cousin um and so for my journey with sitsi which under sitsi's framing was thinking about David Livingstone and the funeral route and Livingstone's body as carried by Susie and Tumor. For me, as a poet, I just felt that that was the perfect metaphorical jumping off point for me to consider ideas around ancestry, um, in particular investigating the two, um, I guess, two of the matriarchs in my family line, my grand, my great grandmothers, um, and investigating their ancestry and, and the stories of them that I carry within me. So the bodies of oral history that I carry um, in the same way that Susie and Tuma were 
carrying a body themselves and thinking of that parallel? Um, women's migration and particularly um, African women's migration can be quite quiet. How were you able to, to uncover their narratives, to find words that, that kind of told their stories beyond your own family history and what you had heard from your, your grandfather and your grandmother? Yeah, I think that's like such a key, a key question and one that certainly I knew, given the specific um, facts of, of life and also, I guess, facts of how bodies are treated as well with regards to my two great grandmothers really stood out for me. So I guess to give give a bit of background to the two figures I'm talking about, my grandmother's mother was one that I wanted to investigate. Um, and she was a mixed woman. Her father, we're told, and everything I feel has to be prefaced with, we are told, um, we're told was a Scottish man, and her mother, we're told, was a Mozambican woman um, who would have come through into Zimbabwe. And then my grandmother, you know, this mixed child, my great grandmother, this mixed child of black and white, we're told, was kind of primarily raised um, in a mission environment, which for me, that in itself threw up a lot of questions, you know, um, we're talking late 1800s. Um, and then at the same time in parallel, my grandfather's mother, so my great grandmother, but on that side, also a mixed woman. Um, I call them my two mixed matriarchs. Um, she traveled through to Zimbabwe from South Africa. Um, and so it was using records to trace her. And so I, for my great grandmother on my grandma's side, I was thinking about looking through records here in Scotland. I looked through the National Library of Scotland archives to try and find out something about the kind, um, you know, anything I could find about Scottish men at that time going over and also looking at mission records. Um, so loads of church records to try and find something out there, but it was very slim and it was very thin on the ground what I could find. And when I went to the National Archives in Harare, um, you know, the archivist basically said, because of the specifics of the history, because this is mixed history um, of this child of, of a black woman and a white man, that is gonna make it hard to find anything, um, which I think was something I'd suspected, but also made me feel like my, the history of myself, of people and body was kind of bound up intimately with the history of racism and colonialism and and southern africa that it was bound up in that history and then with my grandfather's mother um and with the help of my sort of second third cousin um razine we were able to find all of these records from south africa um from church records and baptism records and um because she was christian before conversion to islam so all of these different records, um, and on every single one of these records, this word mixed was stamped. So it was interesting how one of them I could find in records, and one of them I, I couldn't find in records. But I think with both, I felt that the primary things I had to hold on to them were the, the oral history narratives that I was given. Yes, much more so than what's coming across from what you're saying, that colonial classification, you know, we're going to, we're going to define these people by attributes that we put onto them. We're not actually going to say who they are. And it's really interesting. Both of them seem to have traveled really quite far. Isn't well, I, I think my, so my grandmother's mother and she, you know, her mother would have come from Mozambique and her father from, from Scotland, but, you know, she would have been born in Zimbabwe and, and sort of lived her whole life in Zimbabwe. Um, but my grandmother, my grandfather's side, who traveled from South Africa into Zim, um, you know, that, that was a journey she did on her own at a relatively young age, certainly younger than I am now. Um, and so, you know, I think for me, exploring the limited facts that I could about their lives made me think about the characteristics that I can assume from a person. So, you know, for a young woman, turn of the century to travel to a new country on her own. To me, that is a woman who is brave. Um, it is a woman who knows her own mind. It is a woman who fights for herself and wants more for herself. Um, and, you know, with my grandmother's mother, when I think of this 
this young woman who, again, was characterized so much by her independence, um, her strong faith, her living herself for, for herself. I think these are, are wonderful legacies to be carrying within me and sort of made me reflect on my own personal qualities and wonder, you know, is there something inherited there from them? Uh, that thank you that was actually leads into my next question is what you were talking about is the oral histories of these women it's, it's these characters that have kind of come through your family as presences that that are contained within you and how does that come out do you do you feel that you are describing kind of narratives of personhood in your own poetry um so i think i think one thing that often comes up about my so my debut collection about Let Me Tell You This is that it is um, an assertion of the, the I. You know, it's an assertion of the I as a person, the right to speak, the right to have your story told. And then I think, you know, when I look at my main principal mission with Outriders, it was about finding the stories of women who structurally don't always get told, you know, whether through race or gender or class, because um, we, were, we were dealing with all of them, you know, and even their names changed through their lives due to marriage and conversion. Um, and so for me, it, it was about really honouring and saying, I want to listen to these stories. Um, as a descendant reaching back to ancestors, I want to listen to and honour their stories. Um, and it was certainly, you know, when I when I was in Cape Town and I had the opportunity to perform at an event with the Women's Library in Cape Town, which honors Cape Town's women. And in that event, I read a poem that I'd written about one of those two grandmothers, the one who was from Cape Town. Um, and something about having that opportunity to read a poem which was in acknowledgement and reverence to her on what would have been her home soil felt really like coming full circle. And it was a very beautiful and meaningful thing for me. Yes, to, to take her narrative back and, and to be so many generations after her and go, I'm still standing. And actually, I've, I've come back to tell this story is just absolutely wonderful. And yet, even the title of the collection, Let Me Tell You This, that, that affirmative kind of you will listen to these stories because they're important. And, and it all terrifies me sometimes that we're in the 21st century and we're still having to have women shout really quite loudly to get these narratives heard. And you know, whether that is, as, as you did with Outriders Africa, mining these tiny little bits of information from history, you know, having to spend so long in these archives just trying to find information. And, and actually, you said to me that in the Harare archives, you couldn't actually get the information because you weren't Zimbabwean national? Yeah, so um, in order to sort of book in and spend a lot of time in the archives and go through all of the material. Um, you need to be a Zimbabwean citizen. So the plan was that I left my, um, my uncle was gonna be like my, um, my research partner, you know, and it was something we were gonna do together. <laughs> um, I mean, of course, like all of that's really, there's a, a stop put to that because of, of, you know, the coronavirus and, and everything. And, you know, my uncle's a man in his late seventies now, and I just, I, I would never wanna, you know, say to him, hey, why don't you go out on public transport? And, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to say that to him. Um, but yeah, that was our, our plan was that he was going to do that. Um, but certainly, you know, the meeting that I had with the archivist um, was incredibly helpful, you know, and it, it was him who said like this, this history that you are, you are mining into is a difficult history. Um, and so you might not find what you were looking for because of it. Um, and I think I, I, I knew that all along. Um, and while it would have been nice to see these people on records, um, as I had with my grandfather's mother, I still think that I shouldn't let that be a barrier to me reaching out to the sense of knowing her and knowing that ancestor. In, in many ways, I think I value the things passed down like stories and recipes um, more so, you know, because they tell you so much more of a person than what pen and paper can. Yes, the, the, you draw the macro down into to the micro and you, you make it your own story. You take the bits that you need to kind of construct that narrative, which actually does lead me on. You just mentioned it. So COVID-19 hit whilst you were 
out, you know, gathering these stories, how much did it affect your research? Because you, you must have had to have come home quite quickly and, and somewhat truncated everything that you were originally planning to do. Yeah, so I think I was, I think I've been very lucky in the sense that I, um, when I found out about Outriders, I decided to take the full three month tourist visa that you can get in South Africa. And so I was actually, I left for Southern Africa. I arrived on the 1st of February um, and my journey with Sitsi only started on something like the 6th or 7th of March, you know? So all through February, um, I, was, I was doing the research around ancestry in Cape Town and Zimbabwe. Um, I took part in a wonderful project with the, the British Council and the local poetry initiative in Zimbabwe called Page Poetry Alive. Um, and for me, you know, February was just, it was the time of my life <laughs> in the sense of, um, you know, it was the first time I'd had the opportunity to come back as a writer, not a daughter, not, you know, little Lady Nisha, but as a writer in her own right. Um, so that was something really beautiful. And so I'm really grateful that I went so early because I got that. Um, and then I think me and Sitsi got about 10 days together before um, things quite dramatically um, shifted in terms of, of coronavirus and countries locking down and flights getting cancelled and all the rest of it. Um, and so, yeah, it was quite a, a dramatic switch. Um, but, you know, we were we were so well supported and looked after both by the book festival and by our, our local guides, um, Raymond and Eric in Tanzania, who, you know, were faced with this, this challenging situation that nobody could have predicted, you know, with everything just suddenly turned quite dramatically. You know, this was all in the week before the UK went into lockdown, but after Italy had gone into lockdown and it, you know, it just, it all happened and they, they really saw us through it um, in a wonderful way. I think it's very much evidence quite how fragile the, the ecosystems that we run on are. And when countries start shutting down borders, you know, it's, it's, it's just a bizarre thing to think of in, in this current day and age. Uh, what, what was the particular moment that the highlight for you of this trip I mean you talk about reciting that poem in mm. Cape Town you know, going back was was that the moment you kind of thought oh yeah this is it this has been all worth it for this moment or is there another point when you thought yeah this is this is going to kind of sear into my brain when I look back on this um, you know I think it was all wonderful I think you're, you're right to pick up on that moment in Cape Town, I think journeying with Sitsi and bonding with Sitsi um, was, was wonderful. Um, you know, and I think going back to Zimbabwe in particular as a writer, you know, um, and making the connections that I did there was wonderful as well, because like I said before, it's some way, it's a place I've always returned to as a, as a family member. And so to go on my own and be welcomed into, you know, one of my many home countries in that way was particularly important. And even, you know, even the return back to the UK and, and everything that changed with, with, you know, lockdown and COVID and, and all these, these scary dramatic things, even with that happening, there was still something about, um, you know, part of my journey inquiry was to look at the stories in my family and the stories in my family about my grandmothers um, are always around these, complicated road journeys that they took they went on a trip and then something happened and something happened and it was already dramatic and you know and these were um the daughters of one of the women that I was researching and so to be in my own position of going on a, a road a road journey and then something happened and something happened actually in some ways feels like another welcome into being part of their legacy but I now have my own story to tell um that is part of theirs as well I like, yeah, I like that. You have your own fantastical adventure of, of, of following very similar similar routes. I, just a couple last questions. Were you creative during the time that you were on this journey or did you kind of collect ideas and thoughts and now you've come back, you're cogitating on them? 
So um, a mix, a mix. I, I definitely wrote a couple of poems in Cape Town and um, and in Harare as well, because um, I think poetry for me is more immediate. And then for the anthology that's going to come out next year with Cassava, um, I wrote a piece which is based on what happened in Cape Town, but which I think was ruminating or ruminating while um, me and Sitsi were journeying together. And then in the year, sort of immediate days after I got back to the UK, just kind of came all out in one big, in one big rush. And I think, um, yeah, for me, I think it was a very creatively fulfilling experience um, because of how personal the place is to me. Um, and because of how personal my approach is as a writer, it was a, a very wonderful experience. You sound like you, you reclaimed some narratives that had become quite dusty archival stories more generally, and you have kind of pulled them back to life. Thank you so much for talking to me, Nadine. Oh, um, thank if you, anyone is, wants to buy Nadine's absolutely wonderful poetry collections, uh, the online bookshop uh, shop dot edbookfest.co.uk is open and stocks Nadine's book and um, in the second half of this podcast I will be talking to Sitsi and uh, hearing her side of the journey. Thank you so much Nadine. Thanks Kate. Hello welcome to the second part of the Outriders Africa Edinburgh International Book Festival podcast. I'm your host Catherine Simpson digital historian and lecturer in information studies at the University of Glasgow. Today, I am talking to Cece Dangaremba, who with Nadine Aisha Jasset, uh, embarked on an international journey through Africa, meeting writers and communities. Cece was primarily concerned with retracing the route by which Abdullah Susi and James Chuma and their fellow African travelers brought 19th century missionary and explorer David Livingston's body to the coast after his death. Cece is a true Renaissance woman. She was born in Musoko, Zimbabwe. Her first novel, Nervous Conditions, was hailed by Doris Lessing as one of the most important novels of the 20th century and was included in the BBC's 2018 list of 100 books that shaped the world. The Book of Not and This Mournable Body completed the Tambu trilogy. Tambu is one of the great female characters of our time, a wholly complete character whose gimlet eye roams over a burgeoning Zimbabwe and presents truths, both gendered and racial, which are uncomfortable to many as she comments on how she is perceived in the Book of Not as a lump broken from a greater one of undifferentiated flesh. Sitsi founded the Institute of Creative Arts for Progress in Africa in 2009 and its publishing division in 2014. Her short musical uh, Mother's Day was screened at Sundance and she runs capacity building programs for African women filmmakers in addition to fundraising for her own productions. Sitsi, it's lovely to have you here today. Thank you, Kate. I'm glad to be here. Can you tell me a little bit about why you wanted to follow the journey of uh, James and Abdullah to the coast? Well, Kate, um, there has been a lot written about slavery on the west coast of Africa and not so much written about slavery on the east coast. And the incidence of slavery on the East Coast in the 19th century is very interesting because um, there is the intersection of slavery and Christianity, missionaries, and the beginning of commerce with England and some of the other Western countries, European countries. And it, it, it's just something I had not had much information about and I always wanted to find a way into that story that resonated with me. Not being a historian or an academic, I needed a personal story. And actually it was the lack of personal stories that made it so difficult. So when I heard about the body of David Livingston being carried back to the coast from Northern Zambia by his African companions, I thought to myself, those must be the people who carry a story that can bring me into this whole wider context of what was going on um, on the east coast of Africa in the, in the 17th, 18th and even 19th centuries. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Livingston's companions embody a narrative that's, that's usually so silenced, whether it's in the historical record or in literary records. You, you have this 
what is unfathomable when you think about it, jump in time between Livingston dies and then his body makes it back to Westminster. And there is a whole community of people that, that live a journey of, and it's a difficult journey either. It's this tangible experience, which has been almost redacted from our lived records. Um, what, what was the journey like for you and where did you start? You say it was a difficult journey and it was a difficult journey for us in the 21st century with four wheel drives and safari vehicles. So really trying to imagine what it was like for people then is not something I think I was very successful at. We started off in northern Zambia at uh, Jipundu, which is where Livingston actually died. We went to the spot where he died and they have built one of the um, local houses that they used at that time, mainly a straw and pole edifice uh, over the place where he died. The tree that was present at the spot died a few years ago, but they have planted its offshoot there. And it was just amazing to, to stand there and think, okay, this looks pretty rugged to me now. You know, there are all sorts of trees and insects and birds. And, but at the time, pro you probably could hardly penetrate the jun jungle to get there. And um, it was just amazing to think of the dedication of people who would then carry a corpse all the way to the shore. What I also found out is that the swamp in that area, Lake Bangolo, has receded. And so the area that we were at would have been really deep swamp. And it was, it was also a malaria area. And it was just amazing to think that people had such dedication to another human being that they would engage in such a journey. Um, of course, there were tarred roads now, but everywhere on the sides of the road, you could see that this. Everywhere on the side of the road, you could see that this would have been a really wild part of the world to go through. And uh, when we got into Tanzania, things suddenly changed, and there was much more of an Eastern and Arab influence. And I could just imagine uh, a group of black African people trying to make their way through country which was largely controlled by Arab slave traders and having to avoid them and negotiate their way through. It, it, it was an epic journey and we know so little about it because the Western gaze would have been focused on the body of Livingston, which is now silent. And so those living bodies that actually had that experience and made that journey uh, were not of interest. So it was very important for me to find some way of clothing these bodies in flesh and blood and um, giving them some kind of subjective existence. And that's what the journey was about for me. Yeah, subjective existence. I, I love that phrase because you do hear Western narratives where they talk about kind of polar explorers and it's always about keeping the community together and, you know, one dies and, and then everyone, it's, it's this narrative of people supporting each other to, to get back to where they were coming from. But in this instance, James Tuma and Abdullah Susi were, they were keeping a community together of people that had lost their leader. And then they were going in the opposite direction from the way that most of them originally lived. And that just, amazes me and as you say when when as they got into Tanzania they were losing more and more of the goods that they had to trade with so it became an even harder journey where they had to in some instances take longer routes around to avoid certain areas which they knew they couldn't afford to travel through. Um, are there any <laughs> As I digress off into the history, I apologize. Were there any particular bits of the journey that resonated with you now as with them then? Did you kind of feel close to the experience that they must have had? I think I did. I, I think I was in a very receptive frame of mind. And um, there was more evidence of where Livingston had been 
And so at certain parts of the journey, for example, we went up a hill in northern Zambia and they said Livingston went up this hill. Now, because Chuma was his companion, I would then immediately insert Chuma into the picture. And uh, at the points where I could imagine. Now, Chuma was originally from an area probably, <coughs> it's happening to both of us. Chuma was originally from an area in what today is Malawi. And the reason why we know a little bit more about him than uh, Susi, who was one of the other companions, is that Chuma was captured by slave traders at about the age of 11. So we know a little bit more about him. So it was easier for me to picture an 11-year-old boy from a part of the world that is only a couple of hundred kilometers from where I live. I was really able to build up that picture. And I grew up in an area that is, was not exactly rural, but it was quite rugged. It wasn't urban either. And so I did have my experience of trekking through rugged places and going up overgrown mountains, mountains overgrown with, um, with, with bushes and creepers and this kind of thing. And so I did have a kind of my own lived experience that I could at least project onto what I thought they must have experienced. I wasn't coming from such a, a, a different angle that it seemed quite other to me. It seemed familiar. Yes, to, to go to the same places and walk up the same hills, you are embodying that same environment, even though, as you say, particularly at the, at the, the point that Livingston died, it would have been marshy and it isn't marshy now. It's still a very, very rural area. So what was it like with your traveling companion? Um, you and Nadine uh, were certainly together for the first part of the journey, weren't you? Yes. That, that was actually an amazing thing because um, Nadine has connections to Zimbabwe, which I didn't know about when we, when we were introduced to each other. And then we also have the differences in faith. Uh, Nadine comes from a Muslim tradition and I am from a Christian tradition. So in another way, we reflected also some of the complexities that uh, existed within this group of uh, companions who carried Livingston's body back to the, to the coast. And that was something we actually wanted to explore. But of course, Nadine had to, to leave much earlier before we got that far. For, it, actually, it was also very interesting because Susi was quite a bit older than, um, than uh, Chuma. And I am quite a bit older than Nadine. And so <laughs> it was always like the two of us were uh, reenacting that journey in several ways. And it was just a pity that uh, COVID happened. And so we really couldn't continue to the end. You know, it takes time to get to know somebody and we, we had a few days of that in, in Zambia. By the time we crossed into Tanzania, we were really becoming quite close as traveling companions. And then she suddenly had to leave. So it was a bit of a bereavement for me. So I could say that that second part of the journey uh, had that also in common with Livingston's companions because I felt I had just been bereaved. This person I had traveled with all the way from Zambia had suddenly gone. And that was interesting also to, to go through those areas with this sense of, <clears throat> it was interesting to go through these areas with the sense of having lost a companion. And I think that's something that I will be able to bring into my, into the poem that I'm writing about the experience. How, how, is the, how is the creative process going? Did you find that you were taking notes along the way or? Or was it trying to absorb the, the physicality of the experience and then coming back and, and engaging with the, the writing process? I, I did um, journal every day while I was there, and that was really lovely. The, the physical environment was not that different to what I know of from here. It was only a bit more so because it's further north and uh, they get more rainfall than we do here. 
So you know, there were more of the trees and the trees were bigger and taller. So that was really interesting for me. And I, I hope I will be able to get that sense of abundance into, into the uh, poem that I'm writing. What I am finding is that although the experience for me was very present and full of abundance in that I was disinterring this character of Chuma. When I come back to write about it, I am again overwhelmed by the lack because I need to do my research to fill in certain things. I've decided to do the poem um, as a, a ballad about his life. So it begins with his birth in Malawi and looking for um, material on that is really difficult to find. And so I have this interesting juxtaposition of, of real lack, but my own internal idea that there is so much around this person that I need to bring out. I saw a couple of his photographs at Bagamoyo because um, he was taken to England eventually about a year after he had uh, the body had been taken to the coast and they took some photographs of him in England and he looks like a really strong-willed person you, you can feel um, his his aura or at least I could <laughs> shining through the photographs and um, that is something that I want to capture but then again reading the history about his trip to England, there is again the sense of lack, the fact that they had not been invited to the funeral, the fact that it didn't really end as well as they had hoped that it would. And he came back to Zanzibar and really just went back to being a porter um, in not the best conditions until an early death at the age of 32. So um, it turns into quite a tragic story. But for me, the joy is in knowing that tragedy. Because we hear so much about the tragedies of slavery uh, from the West Coast. And yet these things were happening on the East Coast, Mozambique, Malawi, parts of Zimbabwe, parts of Zambia, Tanzania, Burundi, uh, the, the southern parts of Uganda, all of those countries were affected. And I think it's important for our history to know that uh, slave trauma. It's important for our history to know that slave trauma has actually affected the East Coast of Africa as well, and not just the West Coast. Yes, it's uh, particularly when you're uh, reading 19th century uh, Western narratives of the East Coast, slavery is so endemic and it affects so many places. And you know, even even people who have such a, a stellar reputation as Livingston relied on on slavers at certain points and used slave roots and in in Chuma you have this tiny tiny little kind of vignette that fights against the narrative this this young boy who was taken from slavery and he he takes control of his life he kind of he steps forward from the chorus and and it it really does give me hope that over a hundred years later now someone is is amplifying his voice, is saying, no, I, I have walked that route and I have stood on that hill. And, and, and he was a, a human being who had a life. He wasn't just this bit part who is, is presented as an example of why someone else is good. You know, Kate, that's very much the issue here. Um, I talk about the lack which, re which echoes through uh, the lack of record of this person but his act is his record. You have an 11 year old being captured by slave traders and retaining enough humanity and sense of connection and sense of duty and what is right and what is wrong to make such a trip. I mean, there was absolutely no need to. Livingston died, all his possessions were in his boxes around him. They could have made so much money just selling those things and settling down, maybe becoming a little chief in the area, that, that would have been very possible. But they decided, no, we're not going to do this. The right thing is to take this body back to his people. This does say something for, for Livingston himself, because I think if he had not been, if he had been a different kind of person, 
uh, people would not have wanted to go to all that trouble for him. But it still does say something about a, a, a young boy who can develop in that way. Now, we know that it wasn't a smooth development because Livingston had many different companions who would come and go, and they were different kinds of people. And so they also influenced people like Chuma, who were with Livingston for most of the time. And so it was a relationship that developed because sometimes Chuma had at least once that I know of deserted Livingston and came back when others did not. So this is the story of real human growth, you know, of a personality developing and being capable of loyalty and affection and um, responsibility. And this is not the kind of story that you get about African people at that point in time, you know? And so this is why it is so important for me to, to amplify these stories. The story with Susie was a little bit more difficult and that's why I then decided only to go with James Schumer because he was already a young man when he, he met Livingston. So I don't have the whole arc of his development. Uh, the person who really presents a, a more readily accessible arc is Chuma. And also um, the name, it, it's, uh, it's common in my part of the world also. So I felt an immediate connection. And that's why I thought this is the person whose story I want to tell. Yeah, it's a terrible thing to say, but resoundingly true, had it not been for the colors of their skin, it would have been one of the great great journeys of, of the 19th century. Um, I, yeah, I can't imagine how, how you must have felt though, just doing that journey. I mean, when you got towards the end, having, having so poetically almost mirrored the journey and, and losing Nadine halfway through and having to carry on on your own at a time when you really didn't know what was happening in the rest of the world because COVID was this, you know, so incredibly fast moving event. How did it feel when you were coming towards the coast? That is a really important question because thinking about the Chuma's journey, when he got to Tanzania, he met up with um, other British people who wanted him not to continue and to bury the body. And he had to insist that he was going through. So there must have been that anxiety about, will I get to the coast? And of course, uh, not everybody in Tanzania, as you said, would have been wanting to help them, but other, other of the local people would have wanted to exploit them and extract as much as they could from them. So they must also have had that lack of certainty about whether they will actually make it, the absolute certainty about what they wanted to do and that they were going to put everything they had into doing that. But all these circumstances militating against them and making their journey very difficult. So it was very much the same with me. <laughs> Suddenly COVID happened and, I, and my companion has to go back and um, the organizers are very, very concerned about whether I will get out of Tanzania and are suggesting to me that I might want to go home, you know, put everything down. It's like bury the body here and go back home. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to keep on saying, well, you know, I think I could go a little longer and if things get really bad, then I'll stop. And then, you know, I'd have to talk to the, to the guides, um, the tour guides and, ask them if they couldn't hurry things a little bit so that we could go faster to make sure that we could get where we needed to go. And then um, on one morning, my husband called up from Harare and said, Titi, get to the airport now. Luckily, I was about two or three days away from the airport, so I couldn't go to the airport then. So then I realized that I couldn't um, abide by the schedule that I had had. And the reason why he told me to go to the airport was because all the flights were being canceled. I was meant to fly out on Air Tanzania and they had been assuring us that they were going to fly on the day that I was meant to leave. And then all of a sudden, like at half past five in the evening, they canceled all the flights and there was only one in the morning. So that's when my husband called me and said, you've got to make that flight, otherwise you're stuck in Tanzania. 
And I couldn't make the flight because it would have taken about three or four hours to get there anyway. So we were meant to, to spend one more night in that place. And there's some things I had wanted to do. But I thought, I've got to get to the point where they put the body down. Because if I don't do that, I will feel as though I'm carrying this body myself for a very long time, if not for the rest of my life. And uh, so I said to the gentleman, uh, the tour guides, I said, can we just go now? And the organizers were really happy for us to rearrange that whole part of the tour. And so we just dashed to the coast and we made it. <laughs> and I'm so glad that we did because it was such an amazing thing. There is a, a museum there and it is in the museum that I saw the, the first photos of Chuba. So I was really happy to see them. Um, I had seen them on the internet, but to see them actual, the real photos, they were there. And so it Mick was and like Danny, me. Isn't it? Pardon? That's Mick and Danny, isn't it? Where the, photo yeah. Where the photos were? Um, it, it's the, that, uh, the Roman Catholic Church in Bagamoyo. Sorry. Is, yep. is there another one somewhere else? Mick and Danny. Oh, okay. I will probably go there one day because <laughs> I haven't come to the end of this journey. But anyway, I really did feel that I had got to the point where I could put the body down and uh, looked out across the sea, the ocean to Zanzibar and um, I made it. And I had been in such a state before I left. I did an interview at the airport here in Harare before I left because I also um, video chronicled my journey. And, when I, and so when I got to Bagamoyo, I did another one. My husband does editing for me. So when I showed him the videos, he said, Sissy, you just look so awful in the first one. We can't use it. And the one in Bagamoyo was completely different. You know, it, I looked so relaxed and so happy. And it was really this experience of retrieving the being of somebody was really very important for me. And I think uh, this is something that is very important for people of color who, who, whose stories, whose collective stories have more or less vanished into time. The interesting thing is that the people themselves behaved in the same way. Chuma had been to, to India and had learned to write, and there were other people from the, the, from the school in India who could write very well, but they did not chronicle their own journeys in any way. Even the young man who chronicled Livingston's actual death and how they prepared the body did not say much about the problems that they had. You know, and, and it is something about how one perceives one's own subjectivity, not being able to distance oneself enough to want to narrate it in that way, because we never hear about it. And uh, I still have to do more research. I'm sure there is more, research, more material available, but I only have the internet at the moment. And so um, I, I don't think I found out as much as I can. I, oh, I, I love the symbolism of that running for the coast, that just kind of almost, yes, sh shedding all the unnecessary baggage and going, no, we, we have to make this contact. And, and the fact that you clearly physically had gone, oh, I have put the body down. I am mm. here now. Yeah. And the sense of connection about the, the circumstances of being human, that that was a century and a half ago, and I'm having a similar experience of having to fend off circumstances that are preventing me completing the journey as I need to complete it. It, it, was, a, it was an experience of shared humanity, um, and that was really important. It was those little things that contributed to bringing this character to life for me. Something else is that there were also always, um, when I read the Livingston's diaries, I see that there was always, I'll try again. 
when I read Livingston's diaries, I see that they always had challenges in getting enough food. Now I'm vegetarian and I had such challenges in getting enough food. There simply wasn't any vegetarian food. So they would talk about, oh, you know, there was absolutely no food at all, or there was only this and all, only that. I mean, in Tanzania, I, I had stewed vegetables for about the whole week that I was there. And um, that was something else that really made it a lived experience for me. And I could just identify more and more with the, with the kinds of everyday routine challenges that they had had to go through. Oh, yeah, yeah, even, you know, you read about how they would go and negotiate with a certain chief for food. It would be the same with me. There would only be meat or something here and we'd have to go somewhere and maybe the place was already closed and we'd have to negotiate and see whether they had some cabbage or something. It was the most extraordinary experience. Oh, it, it just, it sounds like an amazing journey and just to, to make history tangible and, and to bring it back is just so important. Thank you so much, Titsi, for your time. You are, personally, you are one of my favorite authors and you have opened my eyes up to a world that as, as a white Scottish woman, I think I need my eyes opening up to more. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. Uh, Sitsi's books, if you are interested, can be bought on the online bookshop, uh, shop.edbookfest.co.uk. And uh, thank you to all our listeners. Uh, thank you, Sitsi. Thank you, Kate. Lovely talking to you. And this year's festival program is free of charge for anyone and has been made possible by the generosity of sponsors and donors. If you've enjoyed this event, we'd uh, love you to consider making a donation to the Edinburgh International Book Festival so that they can continue their great work of putting on events for as many people as possible. Thank you very much. <laughs>